There we go. So thank you for the introduction, Jan. Um, I'm excited to give you an overview of the Energy Commission's work with microgrids, which has been uh, going on for more than a decade. What I'd like to do is actually first start with an overview of our R&D program. So I'll, I'll break the presentation up into, into three uh, separate subjects. So I'll quickly go over our EPIC program, spend a fair amount of time on our microgrid research, and then lastly, I'll talk a little about our energy, re our energy storage research since that relates very closely to our microgrid research and is a separate track in terms of our research, but as I mentioned, closely connected to um, to our uh, microgrid research. Um, as was noted, um, if you have questions, please raise your hand. And I'm having a little bit of a difficulty. Hold on a second. Okay, and what I'll do is, um, I was pulling up the participant list because if you have a question during my slides, as was mentioned, uh, please raise your hand and I will uh, discuss those, uh, any clarification questions on the slide. And if we'll go into the longer Q&A, then we'll use the Q&A function. So just to make that uh, the process clear. Okay, so let me first of all talk about the EPIC program. EPIC program was established um, by the PUC um, at the request of the legislature to provide for R&D funding for the state of California to address California's energy goals. Um, we think of those goals currently as kind of three broad topics. We have uh, decarbonization to meet our greenhouse gas emission reduction goals. Um, affordability and equity to meet the needs of reducing the cost of electricity for all rate payers, but uh, particularly for those in uh, low income and disadvantaged communities, we have a, a focus on that because they um, have a higher burden associated with their uh, electricity. And then lastly for resiliency and uh, microgrids fit in a couple of those areas, but we think of them mostly in the resiliency area since they're providing, um, have been providing and the uh, resiliency for their customers, but also that tends to be a strong driver for, um, for someone pursuing a microgrid. Uh, the EPIC program, as I mentioned, uh, it's a large program. It's actually uh, managed by the PUC, um, but there are four administrators of this program, the California Energy Commission, and each of the three in, uh, investor-owned utilities. So Pacific Gas and Electric, uh, Southern California Edison, and uh, San Diego Gas and Electric, the, those are the four administrators. We each get a uh, portion of funding from the EPIC program, and it's about an 80-20 split. So we, uh, Energy Commission has about 80%, and the uh, utilities have about 20%. So they have projects that they fund through the EPIC program, and we have projects that we fund through the EPIC program. Um, the EPIC program has been going on since the early, since about 2013, we're, we're uh, closely approaching our 10 year um, anniversary. The EPIC program for the Energy Commission has had, as you see here, 328 projects and awarded $718 million. Um, and so it's a fairly substantial program that's been going on for that time. We focus on a variety of different topics. The project categories you see down below, we have our entrepreneurial ecosystem. So we have a, you know, the entire program is working to build uh, the capabilities within the state, not only just to provide the technologies to the rate payers, but also to try to support um, small startup companies and get them moving through into the commercialization um, uh, for their technology and bring that into the public sector for the for the rate payers to be able to utilize those technologies. Uh, resilience and safety, as I mentioned before, and grid, de uh, grid decarbonization, as well as building decarbonization. Transportation is another major one that we are focusing on um, because 
It's a very important part with uh, California's goal for uh, electric vehicles in the, um, in the personal vehicles, but also moving into medium and heavy duty vehicles, particularly uh, drivers for school buses and transit agencies. We see the, the larger transportation, the heavier vehicles being a, a greater importance, but also a greater impact on the, on the grid. And then lastly, we have our industrial um, and agriculture program, which focuses on a very important part of California's economy. We have um, three different ways that we fund our research. We have applied research, technology demonstrations, and market facilitation. So let me describe those a little bit so people have a perspective of, of how they align. So applied research, we think of as technologies that may have had a laboratory um, uh, demonstration, but they want to expand that laboratory, bring it into a pilot situation, either a pilot within a laboratory or a pilot in a real world demonstration, real world environment. Um, then there's technology demonstrations, which are taking basically pre-commercial technologies, demonstrating in a real world environment with real world um, end users and applications. And then market facilitation covers kind of the broad uh, 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 prospect of those technologies, trying to scale them up and bring them into market, whether it is helping to provide advice to small startups about how they can um, get investment, making introduction with um, investors, to helping them with business plans, helping them with uh, manufacturing, so they can improve and scale up their manufacturing and be able to meet a growing need from, uh, from the market and be able to support the market. So those are the three basic buckets that we have for uh, funding. And you can see that it follows across the entire life cycle of um, technologies. Now, I will differentiate that uh, early stage R&D we are not in the in the really really early stage. So there is, uh, if you haven't heard of it, Department of Energy has their RPE program, which is taking something from a from a conceptual level and bringing it into a laboratory environment and hopefully scaling up from there. Uh, so they their funding would precede our funding, and in fact we have a close collaboration with them uh, in, order, in order to understand their technologies and how those are progressing and whether there might be an opportunity to phase those into our applied research to continue to bring them to a pilot demonstration. Um, and also we have, through some of our solicitations, the opportunity for companies that were funded by ARPA-E to then um, be more easily brought into a, a solicitation and funded for next scale up. So we have a really close collaboration with them to help in that pipeline of bringing early, early stage technologies, um, hopefully to the pilot demo and then the adoption phase. Uh, one thing that we do uh, work on is, as I mentioned, trying to build the uh, ecosystem within the, within the market. And one of the most recent tools that we developed is the Empower Innovation Tool. What we have found is there's some challenges with getting entities to be able to know what their interests are and be able to pair up um, in general. But for us, it is most important for those connections to be made so that people can bring teams together to provide the best kind of research project possible. So you have a small startup company, they may want to demonstrate their technology in a real world situation. How do they find those real world demonstration sites? How do they find a community, a home, a business to be able to test their technology? Um, so this Empower Innovation tool is open to anyone to sign up for and participate in, but the intent is to try to help bring people together so that they can um, help to identify uh, ways that they can work together. So uh, one particular uh, area that's important for us is doing demonstrations in low income and disadvantaged communities. And the challenge there is how do I identify a low income or disadvantaged community that might want to be a representative location for a demonstration. And um, uh, that challenge is we hope will be alleviated by having this tool. And in fact, we already have a number of communities that have signed up here. They articulate what their interests are. It might be a 
uh, mobile home park community that's interested in, in uh, solar or adding solar and storage. It might be um, another uh, community that's looking for a microgrid. But it's a way for them to announce themselves and then hopefully pair up with uh, technology developers so that they can help put a team together to support our solicitations. One thing I should make you aware of is all of our uh, awards are competitive grants. So we put out a solicitation, uh, people respond to the solicitation, and then we review and score those uh, proposals and then award within the funding allocation that we have set aside for that individual solicitation. And so entities can't just come to us and say, hey, I've got a great idea. I would really like to have you fund me. We don't. Uh, we can't operate that way. We are required to be a competitive um, grant program. And so what we do is our team of folks work to identify what are the critical needs, uh, research needs, put out a solicitation to address those, and then um, get uh, uh, folks to propose. We're very successful at this. We actually have a pretty high response rate, which is very exciting for us um, in the sense that there's a lot of interest in the program and that's great. Um, sometimes it's disappointing to us because we don't have as much money to fund everybody as we would like to, um, but we're able to um, really, uh, I think with the, with the size of the program, we're able to award quite a few substantive grants. And as you'll see, we've, we've been able to do quite a bit of that in the microgrid uh, world. So uh, that kind of wraps up my overview of the R&D program. Hopefully that gives you some perspective our, of our program. And um, I'll see if there's anyone who has raised their hand. It doesn't appear there are any questions at this point. Um, so I will proceed on to uh, discussing microgrids. So um, one thing I should focus on is within the uh, EPIC program, we focus on clean energy microgrids. So there are lots of microgrids that are out there. Those microgrids generally are focused on uh, diesel backup support to facilities. Uh, and that's pretty ubiquitous in the country. However, clean energy microgrids, not as much. Um, there are many reasons for that. Uh, primary reasons are uh, challenges in designing these. Um, and the ability for uh, an entity to know how to pull them together and it takes special um, expertise to be able to pull these together. So we don't see a lot of deployment. Um, most of the uh, privately funded ones are a few privately funded ones and some that are being looked at for by the utilities. Um, but I think most of the ones that we've identified in the state were actually funded by the Energy Commission. Uh, we are finding that they have are showing success. So the initial tranche of microgrids that we have completed have uh, demonstrated uh, some great success and I'll go through some examples of that in a few minutes. Um, and so they have shown that they can al al already provide resilience and cost reduction, um, but we need to continue to demonstrate that they are commercially viable. In other words, the payback is going to be worth that initial upfront cost um, to make them more widely uh, available. The uh, uh, legislature passed SB 1339 uh, a little over a year and a half ago. Um, that legislation requires the Public Utility Commission to help support the commercialization process of uh, microgrids by developing some tariffs and addressing some interconnection issues, which you'll hear uh, as I go through have been some challenges in the past to making these microgrids happen uh, more rapidly. Um, so those will, that proceeding is ongoing. Uh, we're expecting, I think the PUC is expecting a um, early decision to come out within the next month or so. And I think they'll, do, they'll be doing it in multiple stages to be able to address this. Some of the challenges are certainly more complex than they can handle uh, quickly, uh, but they're making progress and in fact looking at how they can uh, deploy microgrids more rapidly, uh, very quickly, hopefully to start getting them in line for uh, fire season so um, we can have rapid deployment of resiliency. But as I mentioned, there are challenges that still remain. So uh, there's high upfront costs and a lot of entity, a lot of uh, building owners or communities can't afford the upfront cost to be able to put these in place. One of the solutions to that that we're finding is as they become more easily designed, you're getting um, providers to work to develop uh, power purchase agreements, so PPAs, so there's no upfront cost to 
the uh, building owner of the community, that that can be uh, wrapped into the overall cost and uh, paid out through their, um, their energy costs over the course of 10 to 20 years. Uh, and that makes it more palatable, particularly for municipalities that may not have that upfront um, uh, money available up front to put it together. Uh, they are still individually designed. Although we're moving towards a plug and play, we're not there yet. And so um, the challenge is getting to that point and we're looking at are there R&D efforts, uh, maybe solicitation that we can work on to help improve the plug and play capability. Um, although there are a few vendors that are, that are moving in that direction. Uh, controllers are still a challenge. There's a, a, a variety of controllers available with different levels of capability. Um, and really selecting your controller is a challenge and you have to be pretty adept at the controller technologies in order to know which ones to choose. And so that can be a difficulty. And you know, hopefully as we move more towards the plug and play that will become more uh, uh, transparent. One of the challenges I think that uh, exists here is there so far tends to be integration, um, uh, in, uh, integrators that pull these together and um, that's great. And they're starting to look at how they can create some you know, very simple ones and how they can create more uh, elaborate ones. And the market is trying to grapple with that so that they can provide services that meet their customer needs. Um, and then uh, right now, because of the uh, designs of interconnections, it can be challenging to do more than just get uh, value for the individual customer. So broader grid, uh, services is still quite a bit of a challenge. So um, I noticed that we uh, have a Q&A question. Ah, uh, so um, we did get a, a question about, are there additional challenges with land control, price zoning and approvals? Uh, very good point. So yes, there are. So permitting can be a, a very difficult um, hurdle to get through. It usually happens faster than interconnection, but it is a problem um, in part because uh, things like um, citing energy storage is still something that most um, uh, authorities having jurisdiction AHJs do not have a whole lot of experience with. And so they approach it very tentatively. They're concerned about the safe field as energy storage. Everyone has heard the stories about lithium ion batteries burning up and there's concerns about that. So the AHJs tend to look very closely at these and make sure that they're very comfortable with the, um, the deployment of energy storage. One thing that we currently have going on is we have just announced a, an award to help develop guidance for AHJs and for the community about how to um, review energy storage, all different types and sizes for behind the meter applications to help create a little bit more standardization in that, in that market, or excuse me, in, in that process so that it's easier, A, for the permitting agencies to understand uh, what they need to look at and how they need to look at it. And then also for the energy storage market, it's very important for them to have some sense of consistency that if they're selling into uh, the Bay Area market or the LA market or the, or the uh, Central Valley market, that there's going to be some consistency in how these things are considered and the permitting process will be a lot easier. Um, so that's uh, answer that question. That's we do see some challenges in that area, and we're working to try to create solutions to fix that. Um, so let me talk through some of the the history of our Epic program, microgrid research. So this goes back more than a decade, um, and it's important to understand that when the Energy Commission, I wasn't with the Energy Commission at the time we started this, uh, thanks to Mike Gravely, who helped um, uh, create this program many years ago. Um, to At that time, it was really, a, the question was, how do you get these uh, distributed energy resources into a system and control them? And at that time, it was you know manual switching, and you know, controllers were not really um, um, sophisticated enough to do that. And so 
it was a matter of how do you make this work. Uh, so that was the very early stage. Uh, once those controllers got to be more capable, um, then it was a question of, okay, so what, how can we start showing the value of these microgrids? So in the 2015 to 2019 timeframe, that was a solicitation that we put out that was for uh, seven microgrids that were focused on, uh, five of them were focused on true resiliency value, and uh, two were focused on just large amounts of, of distributed energy resources and how you integrate those together. Those seven projects just ended um, last year. And uh, so we're still going through all the lessons learned. I'll go through some of that today. But uh, they provided a rich uh, environment of, of data gathering to help us understand those values. And then uh, on the heels of that, we recognized that some of the some of the recipients from that solicitation were starting to make inroads and being able to demonstrate that they could um, possibly commercialize their solutions. And so the next question became, how do we demonstrate the commercialization pathway better? And so we know technically we can do it. We know the prices of solar and storage are going down. How do we develop uh, replicable pathways? And so we, came out with a solicitation in 2018. Those will run through till 2023, where the purpose of those microgrid projects is simply to build the microgrid out and, and create a business model such that those, um, those microgrids can be replicable uh, throughout the state in a variety of applications. And we do have a variety of applications that will be uh, demonstrated there. So there were nine awards as part of that solicitation. But one other thing I want to point out is that, so we've had this, as you see on this arrow, we've had kind of this focused attention to microgrids over the years, but we're also finding that uh, as, as proposals come in for other projects, whether they be industrial efficiency, whether they just be uh, solar applications, for a variety of different purposes that may not be focused on microgrids, but may be focused, as I said, on efficiency or uh, solar implementation or storage, that customers are starting to want to have that microgrid capability. So in addition to the, the seven in the 2015 to 2019 timeframe and uh, an additional nine in the 2018 to 2319 timeframe, we have a very robust uh, portfolio of microgrids that are currently in development that we'll be learning about from a variety of different perspectives. And so we're very excited to have, um, have that uh, happen. So uh, I, there is another question that came up. What's the biggest challenge that you see when selecting controllers, integration, proprietary protocols? So the biggest challenge I think right now is it's not something that mostly anyone um, that, that a typical, say a typical energy manager would be able to go out and do very easily. I think the, t the controllers are getting more sophisticated and, um, and under, in, a, in, a, in a energy manager knowing how to select that controller for the functionality that they want, not overbuying or underbuying, I think is a challenge. I think there's a difficulty with um, um, uh, being able to select those and knowing what to select. Now, I will say the, the developers are getting their products much more clearly defined. Uh, they are expanding the services that they provide. So you're also getting more options uh, and that may also be difficult because you may not want all the options that they provide you may want a very simple one and they may provide more but they're you know they're looking to provide a wealth of of, um, of services um, but I, I see it as a little bit like buying a car sometimes you can't pick and choose the options that you want it comes packaged with things that you may never use and really making that selection I think can be difficult uh, also uh, I don't think we've really come through the a clear path for cybersecurity that is improving uh, and entities are looking at, you know, the, the manufacturers are looking at certainly making their systems more cybersecure. 
but I don't think it's really clear yet um, how to make that choice and how to ensure that your system has cybersecurity. So I think those are all still challenges with, um, with the, um, with the uh, control of the, of the or, or selecting your controller. Uh, so, as I mentioned, we have quite a few projects. We have 35 different microgrids going on around the state. Um, we have 100 million that in Epic funds that we've invested. And typically when we put out a solicitation, we require match funding, which means the recipient also has to put money into this. We want them to have skin in the game in the project. And so you can see $80 million in match funding. So it's uh, and it's actually, that's probably brought down by the earlier years where we funded more, but now it's pretty much 50-50. Uh, all of them are looking at increasing resiliency. That's a huge driver right now. Um, we're looking at maturing the microgrid control technologies. Um, we're trying to gather as much of the best practices out of these as possible and make those available uh, more broadly. And so it's an ongoing process of collecting information and sharing it. And hopefully through this process, we're helping to drive down the costs and establish um, some deployment norms. So another question that came in is, uh, what are the best resources to start learning about the best controller technologies option on the market? I have to say, we don't have that yet. I, I've not seen any, uh, any specific source. It's a matter of going to the individual manufacturers and, and and evaluating them. No one's done kind of their consumer reports of the different options. You have to look at each individual option and try to figure out what, whether it has the solutions that you want um, and the services that you want. And so there's a variety of options on the table. There's Siemens and Schneider, the, the uh, main entities. SEL, Schweitzer Electric makes portions of it that they're building into microgrid controls. Uh, there are entities that uh, are, have been recipients of our, pro our projects that have created their own control software uh, and, and systems like Gridscape and um, ChargeBliss. So it's really, it's, you have to go out there and do a lot of research. There's not a particular location where you can find all the information on them and, and the services that they provide. But hopefully um, through our research, we can um, start assembling that information and we're looking to try to do that through the um, through learnings from our projects. So um, we have a range of applications. We have uh, through our solicitations and the, the formation of our solicitations and what we ask for, we've gotten some diversity, but we just find that recipients are giving us a lot of diversity as well. So we have many critical facilities that's typically driven by the um, need for resiliency. We have two ports that have been recent recipients, the uh, Port of San Diego and the Port of Long Beach, which are doing some interesting projects. The military has some very interesting projects. And uh, for those that would think, well, maybe that's just applies to the military, it turns out that they're looking at applications that can be transferable to other customers. So, you know, bad image at the very bottom, but data centers are huge um, opportunities and, and have substantial issues, particularly with, um, you know, they, they can't, stay, they have no tolerance for uh, a break in energy. So they've got to have constant. And so even switching over from grid mode to island mode can be a challenge. And so a project we have going on at Port Winini will look at uh, applications for a data center. Um, Camp Parks is looking at nested microgrids. So they'll have a microgrid for the entire base and then they'll be broken up into some smaller microgrids. And what are the lessons learned for that? Um, the other picture is for um, Miramar, which is looking at using landfill gas and, and helping to levelize the landfill gas. So even though they're military, and you think that's well, a, it's a very focused uh, application, it turns out that they're looking at some of the very challenges that we'll see elsewhere in the state. We have a number of them in communities and then some in industrial sections as well. So we're, we're looking to grow and expand these. Uh, we also have a, a diverse set of designs in our portfolio that we're learning from. So we have, uh, in terms of owners, we have end use owners, third party owners, like I said, the PPAs and utility owners. And the, the one utility owner I'll talk about a little bit is Borrego Springs and that's San Diego Gas and Electric. 
That's our only uh, utility one that we have funded within Energy Commission funding. But we have a number of end user and third party. AC coupled and DC coupled um, operations, a variety of sizes. So I'll talk about some of the variety of sizes here from the very small like fire stations to the very large like an entire community. And the experiences that we're gathering from everything from, from the small to the large. Um, as well as a variety of obviously of generation and storage sizes. So from the very low, which I mentioned here, uh, actually the 37 comes from one of the fire stations to the very large storage right now, or the largest in our portfolio, which is actually associated with a, an air, a community airport microgrid up in Humboldt County. Um, some of our lessons learned, I've gone through some of these so far, but I'll, I'll touch on some other ones. Biggest part of the pre-design, I think, is, as I mentioned before, that having the expertise, it's, it, it generally is taking some very focused expertise to be able to try to pull these microgrids together, select the technologies and integrate them. We need to get more to a plug and play um, manner, and so we're working to, to try to do that. But that was, you know, each of the microgrids we've had right now have been of the type that has People often say, you've seen one microgrid, you've seen one microgrid, because each one was designed slightly differently, had different operations. We want to move that to a more consistent approach. Um, and the design build, as I mentioned, interconnection uh, permitting as well, but interconnection can take the longest, sometimes from six months to a year for the interconnection to happen, depending upon the complexity of the microgrid and its application and where it's located. The challenge, the biggest challenge with that is for the developer or the owner, you go into the developing a microgrid at a point where you may not know how long that process is going to take. And that, you know, time is money. And so that's very difficult for developers to know that unknown. And, I, and that's in part why the CPUC is working through this to try to figure out how to streamline that process to make it easier, make it more consistent so that it gives some additional confidence to developers and owners um, that they get into this process, that it'll go more smoothly, as well as information available to communities. So communities will know where the greatest congestion and issue is in their community and, and know where, the, where it could be easy or more difficult to, um, to focus on the, uh, or where the interconnection might be a problem. And the operations and maintenance, so like with the pre-design, operations and maintenance takes special expertise. Uh, if you're a building energy manager, you may be able to pick that up and be able to run it very well. And there are examples in our portfolio where they've done that. Some of them have contracted out that O&M. And so uh, you, something that a, that a owner operator has to think about going into it is how are you gonna keep this thing operational over time? A contract for ongoing maintenance, or you plan to do it yourself. So some thinking that has to go into that that um, may not be the case in, of, with individual um, applications. So let me go through some examples, and I'm going through these too quickly, uh, of some of our, uh, our successes. So this one, uh, Blue Lake Rancheria has received the most press and the most interest around the country. It's been a very successful uh, microgrid. So this was designed by the Schatz Energy Center at Humboldt State University for the Blue Lake Rancheria, uh, which is actually um, a casino, but that casino is also at an American Red Cross shelter, provides needed services to the community in the event of a grid outage. Uh, this microgrid um, supports um, that, that rancheria and um, it actually has uh, done a couple of things that were pretty interesting during the course of the of the microgrid development after it got operational but before the end of the agreement there was a, a fire nearby grid went out this thing islanded seamlessly and in fact the rancheria did not even know that the power had gone out until they got a notice from pg and &E that the power had gone out so it was successful in the sense of transferring over from grid tied to independent um, operation very seamlessly, which is great. But most importantly, during a, a public safety power shutoff last fall, it demonstrated multiple capabilities. So it provided uh, energy for uh, 10,000 community members to be able to come to the uh, Red Cross Center and be able to utilize 
the energy there and be able to, you know, uh, take care of basic functions. They're able to set rooms aside in the hotel for people with medical conditions that required electric equipment to keep them alive. The community um, themselves determined that it saved four lives as a result of the operation of that microgrid. They were able to operate their gas station, which was the only operational gas station in the community to help people have um, fuel uh, for their vehicles, which is uh, a great service. And they provided simple things like charging capabilities for phones, but also ice for the community. So that microgrid operated uh, really excellently. It's an award-winning microgrid, multiple awards. And in addition to all that resilience, they're also showing that they're getting 58% reduction in energy costs over the course of each year. So the success of it has been so great that the ranchery has decided to expand it. They're going to double the capacity of the microgrid. And so it's really one of our greatest successes from the, from the research. Uh, and uh, Humboldt State, as you see, has gone on to win another award to do another really uh, interesting project. Um, I'm realizing that it's about quarter after, so I'm going to go through the next examples more quickly. Uh, microgrids for fire stations, Gridscape developed this system. They actually did it for three fire stations. Um, those fire stations have been, get, uh, have had, have been able to island for up to 10 to 12 hours. Uh, they have, uh, the uh, fire chief has considered the value of these microgrids important because they have to rely on diesel backup. In an emergency, when they run out of diesel, they're back on the market competing with everybody else for diesel at that time. And so it can be very difficult for them to replenish their diesel. And anything that allows them to, to extend their diesel source is really an important aspect for them. So um, that is a, uh, uh, another great success from our perspective. Borrego Springs is our utility microgrid. This one was developed by San Diego Gas and Electric through multiple, um, through multiple awards from Department of Energy and Energy Commission. This island's an entire community of Borrego Springs, and they have exercised it for multiple um, applications in the case of storms that have cut out power or when they needed to do work on the transmission line. So this community is at the end of a transmission line. If that one transmission line goes out, they're out of power. So part of developing this was to help bring that uh, capability to, um, to the community. There are two new ones that are in development. As I mentioned, Humboldt State is developing this one at the Redwood Coast. This one will support not just the airport, but other customers behind the same point of, of common coupling. Uh, and as a part of that, it's going to be co-owned by PG&E, everything in front of the meter, and uh, the Redwood Coast Energy Authority, the CCA, everything behind the meter. And they're working on creating experimental tariffs on how they can share um, uh, electricity between the two um, and how they deal with that. Um, then we have the Lancaster Advanced Energy Community. This one's actually going to create a virtual power plant for the city of Lancaster uh, that will include multiple microgrids, multiple types of energy storage, um, and bringing it all together to create a green district and a, and a, uh, a full virtual power plant. So this one is just in the early design phases, but a very uh, innovative approach was part of our Advanced Energy Community um, uh, solicitation, not part of our microgrid solicitation, but again, incorporates multiple elements and we look forward to that one moving forward. And then I'll just briefly go on to, since we're getting low on time, our energy storage. We have a separate effort. California is already a big user of energy storage and it's growing. Um, we look at trying to do three different things with our uh, research strategy. Diversify, our focus there is on uh, identifying and helping develop non-lithium ion based um, energy storage devices. Those being things like uh, flywheels, flow batteries, alternative chemistries to demonstrate uh, those energy storage technologies in a variety of applications and then helping to de-risk, in this case, lowering the manufacturing costs of those 
technologies so that we can, um, they can be more competitive with lithium ion. So I have a few questions that have come up as I've tried to run through the, the, um, so the rest of the slides here and give more time for questions. So I'll start with, uh, I think what is the oldest question, which is what's the business case for these microgrids? Examples you have used, are they viable without subsidies? If not, what percentage of the costs were covered by subsidies? So that's a really good question. So from our first seven, that we came across that we that we invested in those required subsidies um, to be able to make them viable. The next set, the current set, the nine that we currently have, are intended to demonstrate that you can make a microgrid cost competitive without subsidies. Now, there's research elements that come as part of that, which is why we have funding that we've supported those projects but the intent is for those projects to be able to demonstrate that without any subsidies at all, they can be cost competitive. That's one thing. If you look at someone like Gridscape that's developing this model based on the Fremont fire stations, they actually have created a business model that they're selling around the state and there's multiple communities that they're selling this to using a PPA approach to be able to bring microgrids to more fire stations, 911 call centers, emergency centers, et cetera. So there is a path for these without subsidies. Uh, and they are also one that's developed a package system. So they're early in that phase. Um, I would not say that it's you know, uh, really widely deployed uh, in the state, but we're moving in that direction. So feel very positive about that. The next question, are delay and cost risks associated with the interconnection correlated with the size of the microgrid? Uh, I would say generally the answer to that is yes. However, it also relates to uh, where it is on the grid and it could be a small one. It could be the individual reviewing it at the utility uh, being more um, uh, uh, particular or more uh, um, specific about what has to happen. We've seen a lot of different situations where even in the Fremont fire stations where Two of them got through the process and the third one took longer. No good reason for it. In reality, the utilities are getting more and more interconnection requests and they're building their capabilities, expanding their capabilities. So I think there's some growth issues at the utilities and they've done a lot to try to improve that, streamline their processes, but we still have a long way to go uh, in making that process much easier. Next question. What are the biggest technical challenges for the Blue Lake Branch Rio microgrid to support at the time, knowing that they need to do it pretty quickly? I'm not quite sure um, I understand that question. Um, if you could clarify that question, that would be great, and I'll come right back to it. Uh, next question is, what value are entities attributing to resilience when assessing the business case economics? So we have uh, requested them to look at, obviously, upfront costs and the generally the um, value of the energy saving. We do not have a good way at this point to cover things like resilience and quantifying resilience. It will be up to the individual recipients to try to figure out the way to do that. Um, in some cases, it can be relatively easy. If you have an industrial facility or you have um, any other kind of commercial facility where downtime results in, you know, is definitely equated to cost, it'll be easy to do that. It'll be much more difficult to do in things like community centers or others. And so we are still uh, trying to come through that. There's a project that the governor's office uh, put forward to try to look at the cost of resiliency. I think it's going to take a while for that uh, research effort to come to fruition, but uh, it's definitely something that we struggle with and, you know, anyone who has great ideas, please pass them along because we always look forward to uh, ways to help capture the resilience. Right now, it's, it's, uh, there's not a great path out there for them. Um, Question is, can you talk more about how the PPA approach works? Sure, so the PPA approach works by, say, the developer um, drawing upon uh, investor money, which is then used to pay for the equipment and the development of the microgrid without the cost of the 
um, being borne by the, the owner of the facility, then what happens is that developer takes over the energy costs from the utility and they take a certain, and, and so they are guaranteeing a certain amount of cost savings for the building owner over time or for the customer over time, but they're also taking some amount of that savings, the overall savings, and helping to pay back the investor for the money that they put in in the front. So the investor is putting money in and getting some payback um, over time, and the um, facility owner is getting reduced energy costs, maybe not as much as if they paid for it themselves, or definitely not as much as if they paid for it themselves, but certainly some cost savings that they can realize plus the value of the resilience. Next question. If Epic supports new non-lithium ion technologies, wouldn't this result in increasing the time and difficulty of securing permits as the utilities need to learn the new technologies to provide the permits? So yes, I think that can happen and no, it may not. I think it will depend upon the technology and depend upon uh, the utilities evaluation of it. So for example, if you look at this uh, picture that we have up on the screen of the EOS Aurora, this technology is a very stable, non-toxic, um, it's an environmental friendly, easy to recycle, uh, no chance of burning. The safety features associated with that are much better than lithium ion. Um, and so I think it would be relatively easy to make the case that that one is, rel is much easier to permit than maybe a lithium ion technology. So yes, there'll be a learning curve, but we think the value of having a, a diversified portfolio is important. The other reason it's important is because right now, lithium ion um, has a number of challenges. I mentioned the, the fires, but there's also uh, acquisition of the, of the materials needed to make lithium ion, not just the lithium, but the cobalt that lead to equity issues in other countries, also lead to supply issues. There are, um, uh, also competition between the transportation sector and the, 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 the mobile and the stationary. So right now, um, there's a lot of, of lithium ion going into the mobile sector and there'll be competition for it on the, on the uh, stationary sector and that can be a problem as well. Okay, so I, think I think Dave, little, you're clearing up all the questions. Let's move on. So that, that takes me, uh, that was the end of my presentation. So I didn't see any hands raised. I think I've gone through the whole Q&A. Any other questions? Uh, we do have one uh, guest, AJ, uh, raise a hand. Let me unmute him or her. So AJ, now you are allowed to talk. AJ, can you hear me? Okay, apparently I think uh, he muted himself or herself. Oh, he doesn't have a microphone. Okay, let's move on and see. Do we have any other questions from attendees? So now you have two ways you can do that. One is keep typing your questions uh, on the Q&A, or you can raise your hand and uh, I'm going to unmute you so you can ask your question live. So Dave, I do have one question. So uh, I think a lot of people ask about the controller question and uh, there's a very active uh, community and working group at IEEE working on the uh, 2030.7 and the 2030.8, uh, which is specifically for the uh, functionality for the controller and also the testing for the controller. So how, and uh, uh, energy commission and uh, this project can contribute to the society working uh, in the controller functionality designs. 
Yeah, so, so that's actually a really good question and is one that we is on our, on our near term list to focus on is uh, more on the controller technologies and the uh, uh, capabilities and the designs and trying to make move more towards the plug and play. So we anticipate that we'll be having some future solicitations that will help to hopefully move the needle on those controller technologies and bring them into a more rapid deployment um, option case. So basically making it easier for end users to be able to select and, um, and implement them, particularly in you know, some of the simpler cases like um, you know, smaller uh, resilience facilities. Thank you very much. So I think we are uh, in the end of the one hour seminar. And uh, again, thank you very much, Dave, for this excellent uh, knowledge sharing and the presentation with the uh, Stanford students and the community. And uh, uh, last, let me do a very quick housekeeping things here. So uh, thank you, Dave, to give the first uh, Smart Grid uh, webinar uh, in this quarter, in the spring quarter and uh, under this global uh, pandemic of the COVID-19. And uh, we're going to have another three excellent topic and speakers uh, in the next uh, uh, several weeks and uh, on the area of uh, uh, great resilience and uh, security. So stay tuned. And uh, uh, for the students, please, uh, if you haven't, you know, please register for this seminar, uh, which will go to offer one unit uh, credit. Thank you all for your time and uh, see you again. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Dave.